I'm Steph Herbstritt. I'm a graduate student at Penn State working with Tom Richard on warm season grass mixtures. And today we're talking about multifunctional buffers as an opportunity for warm season grasses and some of their water quality impacts. So first I wanna ground us. What's happening in our world? Farmers experience risk to weather, heat, cold, droughts, flood. We need to remove carbon from the atmosphere to address climate change. Different strategies can be used to sequester carbon. One strategy we can use is terrestrial sequestration. And terrestrial sequestration means using plants to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then store it as carbon in the stems and roots of the plants as well as in the soil. So in photosynthesis, which is what you're seeing on the slide here, plants take in carbon dioxide and give off um, the oxygen to the atmosphere. And um, they use the carbon in that process to live and grow. And when the plant winters or dies, part of the carbon from the plant gets preserved in the soil. And this is an awesome process and we get oxygen as a byproduct. Also on a good note, what's happening in our world right now, warm season grasses are in demand. This is the short list of markets Will mentioned during the first in this series of webinars last week. You can see everything from poultry bedding to silt socks and absorbents and maybe future markets like bioenergy. What else is happening in our world? Water pollution is a problem. This is an aerial view of um, Virginia's James River upstream from where it empties into the Chesapeake Bay. The red stain you see is actually a massive algal bloom fed by excessive amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. We have 12,000 miles of impaired streams and rivers uh, in Pennsylvania in the Bay watershed. These are impaired from soil, from erosion, and nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizer running off the landscape. And there are even more impaired stream miles across the Commonwealth when you consider the Ohio, Delaware, Erie River basins. And here you can see a schematic of the contributions of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that are entering surface water and causing pollution in the bay, coming from agriculture and green, um, urban contributions in blue, and then there's some natural sources that we see in yellow. To improve the Chesapeake Bay's water quality, the United States Environmental Protection Agency requires our state and our neighbors in the Bay, Delaware, DC, Maryland, New York, Virginia, and West Virginia to reduce the amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment or soil that's leaving our states and entering the Bay by these amounts by 2025, 34 million pounds of nitrogen, about a million pounds of phosphorus and about 531 million pounds of soil. And to meet these pollution reduction goals, the Pennsylvania Departments of Environmental Protection, Agriculture, and Conservation and Natural Resources coordinated a process with a lot of partners to develop a plan. And the plan is called Pennsylvania's Chesapeake Bay Phase Three Watershed Implementation Plan, or the Phase Three WIP. And just to put these large numbers into perspective, the Environmental Protection Agency estimates our state purchases about 40 million pounds of nitrogen annually in fertilizers, and we produce about 55 million pounds of nitrogen and about 15 million pounds of phosphorus in animal manure every year. So not a trivial amount of two um, valuable nutrients our food and agricultural systems rely on. One strategy being used to meet the watershed implementation plan goals is planting buffers. Buffers are just strips of perennial vegetation, and this can include like trees, shrubs, grasses, other herbaceous material along streams. And they buffer soil and nutrients that might otherwise run off that adjacent land. In this case, you see here on the far right of the stream, a cornfield. And buffers are often planted as three zones. First, large trees immediately along the stream, followed by 
smaller trees and shrubs, and then herbaceous material like grasses, sedges, flowers. And when I say multifunctional buffers, I'm talking about a buffer that harvests products from zones two and three, the small trees and shrubs and herbaceous zone, um, and sells those crops that are harvested for revenue. This is a, this is a new concept. Um, it was piloted by the Department of um, Conservation and Natural Resources in 2015. So it's a new concept, harvesting and buffers. And it's a great addition to the functions buffers already serve. So what are those functions? I just want to back up it so we're all grounded in how buffers can help us across the Commonwealth. First, buffers shade streams to keep uh, temperatures cool for our cold water fish populations. They provide leaf litter for aquatic bugs whenever leaves and um, other plant material fall into the soil and then into the stream. They reduce the amount of soil that's eroding from our farms into streams by physically stopping the soil with surface vegetation and deep root systems. Buffers also reduce downstream flood impacts by slowing down the flow of water, giving it time to infiltrate into groundwater and using some of that water in plant growth. Buffer plants also take up nitrogen and phosphorus as they grow biomass. And all of these processes contribute to improving water quality. Buffers also provide habitat for native bees that pollinate our crops and allow space for wildlife, um, like pheasants. And in addition, a multifunctional buffer provides revenue to landowners because you're harvesting from portions of the buffer rather than just leaving that perennial vegetation alone. Uh, multifunctional buffers can diversify a farm's crop portfolio by incorporating new and different crops that you might not otherwise grow on your farm. And they incorporate perennial crops that may be more resilient um, to floods and droughts than annual crops that you might otherwise be planting there. And all of, all of these things can kind of help us better um, plan for land along streams and better plan for overall farm systems. So these functions of buffers are great but we still have a long way to go to meet um, the goals set by the Commonwealth and our watershed implementation plan. This graph shows buffer acres planted since 2010. That's when the watershed implementation plan phase one was implemented. And buffer acres planned on the landscape by 2025. That's when the phase three watershed implementation plan ends. And you can see we have planted almost 19,000 acres of buffers since the beginning of the WIP in, in 2010, um, but we still have over 100,000 acres to go. The phase three watershed impl implementation plan calls for 83,000 acres of forest buffers and 50,000 acres of grass buffers in the next five years. So we have, a long, we have a long way to go. And during a recent Chesapeake Bay program workshop with farmers, academics, industry, government, and other stakeholders, Warm season grass multifunctional buffers were identified as the only option available now that has markets that could purchase um, or grow to purchase the amount of biomass in the buffer acres proposed in the WIP. And Will will post these slides after the presentation, so you will have the links if you're interested in checking out the pre-workshop webinar and the, the full workshop report. To recap, we think a warm season grass or other perennial grass multifunctional buffer could improve water quality and soil health, help remove carbon from the atmosphere, reduce risk farmers experience by diversifying farm portfolios and, and focusing more land on perennial crops that might be more resilient than some annual crops. We think they can provide marketable biomass material, so material that can be sold and generate revenue, and scale to meet uh, those, those really big phase three watershed implementation plan goals. But as a lot of you know, we don't have a lot of switchgrass in Pennsylvania. Uh, this map shows the existing switchgrass 
land area reported by the United States Department of Agriculture multiplied by um, modeled county level yields. And if you note the scale, it's a little misleading. Most of the counties that pop up with any shade of blue have less than 30 tons per year. Uh, we only have about 2,600 acres in production producing around 18,000 tons right now. So it, switchgrass doesn't represent um, the majority market for agriculture in our state. So at Penn State, we partnered with Earned Seeds in 2018 to demonstrate switchgrass mixtures as a viable multifunctional buffer option that could improve downstream water quality in buffers along streams and along fields, uh, reduce risk and provide profit. Uh, Calvin Ernst is shown here speaking at one of our field sites. You can also see Will in the photograph and others you might recognize participating and helping. So we're studying three switchgrass mixtures for yield and water quality at two sites. The one here, the Penn State Rockview Farm, and one in partnership with a collaborating farmer along Spring Creek, which is a high quality cold water fishery in Center County. And as you can see, this site gets frequently flooded. So it's definitely a risky, risky area. We planted three treatments in late spring 2018. Treatment one is a mix of three switchgrass cultivars. So the tables I'm going to show you over the next few slides show the percent of each cultivar in a pure live seed mix in the first column, and then the plants, their common name in column two, and the cultivars in, common, in column three. So treatment one uh, is a mix of Bowmaster, Colony, and Canlo switchgrass around 30% of the mix for each of those. There's the percent of the mix. And then treatment two is treatment one plus blue stem. So we added in um, Prairie View, Niagara, big blue stem, and you can see the percent mix changes, but we still have uh, predominantly switchgrass at around 55% of the mix. And then treatment three is treatment two plus six pollinator attractors, still primarily focused on switchgrass, almost 50% of the mix, um, but we added to the, the blue stem, common milkweed, New England aster, partridge pea, ox eye sunflower, black-eyed Susan, and Canada goldenrod. And so here they are, treatment one, this is our switchgrass growing in year one. Treatment two, um, it, this is the big blue stem. With switchgrass, you see blue stem much taller than the switch. And then treatment three, we see in between um, Tom Richard, the principal investigator on this project, and Calvin Ernst. You can see the turkey foot top of the blue stem from treatment two in the background. And this is treatment three when it looked like the Black Eyed Susans were taking over. <laughs> The demonstration sites are outfitted with climate stations so we can track precipitation and wind speed and relative humidity. They're also outfitted with a surface water pipe collection system so we can collect surface water samples after storm events. And then we take those samples back to the lab and analyze them for water chemistry so we know how, how much nitrogen or phosphorus is running off each plot. And there are tipping buckets at the end of the PVC pipes you saw on the last slide, and these help us so we can collect a composite surface water sample. And the tipping buckets are equipped with a reed switch that you see here that enables a data logger to record each tip. So we can take the surface water concentrations, which we measure in the samples when we take them back and analyze the water chemistry in the lab. So we can take that concentration and multiply it by surface water flows to calculate the nutrient load. And recall, like the loads are what we're tracking in the phase three watershed implementation plan, that 34 million pounds of nitrogen, 1 million pounds of phosphorus, 531 million pounds of soil. At the bottom of each treatment plot, and these plots are about 100 feet long, to give you some perspective, we have ceramic suction cup lysimeters at six inches and 36 inch depths into the soil to capture shallow and deep root zones of like corn and, and grasses. And we have soil moisture probes. So we know when our lysimeter samples represent shallow subsurface water versus groundwater. 
And I guess just backing up, a lysimeter is essentially just a PVC pipe with a cup on the bottom of it. And we can put a vacuum on the PVC pipe by um, attaching a pump to like the green and, and black wires that you can see there. And then that allows the lysimeter to suck in the water from around them. And that's how we get a subsurface water sample. Okay, so I'm just gonna share a few of the results we have so far. This slide shows surface water results. The plot on the left is nitrate nitrogen that's leaving each of the plots per area per year. Um, so here I'm reporting this in units of kilograms per hectare per year, but you could also think of this in terms of pounds per acre per year that's leaving each plot. The orange bar on the far left is the nitrate nitrogen that we measured leaving the corn plots. The green bar is the nitrate nitrogen that we measured leaving treatment one, the switchgrass plots. Um, and then the blue bar is the, what we measured leaving the switchgrass and blue stem plots, so treatment two. And then the pink bar is the um, nitrogen leaving treatment three, the switchgrass and flower plots. And when we compare the three treatments to corn as a baseline, we see um, about a 20% reduction in average in nitrogen leaving the plot. So that's a good thing because we want to keep that nitrogen on our fields. And then the plot on the right is phosphorus. And this is um, our 2019 data. And again, like when we compare the warm season grass, those three treatments, treatments one through three, which are green, blue, and pink, um, to corn, which is kind of our baseline scenario, um, we again see a reduction in phosphorus. So that's a good thing because we want to keep that phosphorus on our fields. And if we looked at an overall nutrient balance, balance, we would likely see more nitrogen and phosphorus being taken up each year in plant biomass in the corn and grass treatments. Um, and that's why we have to fertilize crops because plants take nutrients up. Um, but with, with grasses, they usually translocate them to their roots later in the year, which is great because we get to store them for next year. Um, in terms of that biomass, though, we planted in late spring 2018, and when we sampled um, after that fall 2019 to spring 2020 season, we found on average we got about um, five and a half tons per acre from our warm season grass mixtures, which was pretty exciting. <laughs> um, and so you might remember this photo of switch sock from Will's slides last week, but next steps at our field sites um, is to harvest. This fall, we're harvesting our grass plots at Rockview. We're going to be testing these three warm season grass mixtures in erosion control socks in collaboration with MKB company or Diamond Sock, the company that produces switch sock. Uh, currently, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection has approved weed free switch grass for use in these socks, but more diverse mixtures like will be testing or not yet approved. And we think a lot of stakeholders would be happy with expanding that market to include more diverse form season grass mixes. So that's kind of exciting and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, another next step at Penn State is more demonstration of this concept. So um, because we got a grant through the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources with Clearwater Conservancy, which is a local watershed group in Center County, we're able to um, plant 35 acres or three more sites with warm season grass mixes, along with like trees and shrubs um, with farms this fall. So in collaboration with Clearwater Conservancy and farmers, we're gonna be planting these three sites. And um, we'll be planting the mixes I've shared already, as well as a few, a few more um, in partnership with Earned Seeds and kind of based on landowner preferences, like we're including forage chicory and um, sunflower and Virginia wild rye, which is a cool season grass, but still native, just based on what uh, a lot of the farmers want. So switching gears a little, buffers, I think, are just one piece of this equation. But Penn State, we're also thinking about other land areas, which we could use to grow warm season grasses to fulfill current and also future markets that might grow in the next, next decades. So we're asking, you know, how much barren land is available for warm season grasses? And what about fallow and idle cropland? Um, so the next few slides, uh, we'll 
walk through these points, including unprofitable cropland. And we'll save number five, double crops um, on profitable cropland for another presentation. But I think it's worth mentioning that we are looking at, you know, when farming for water quality, we are looking at cover crops and double crops because um, I think these have a, a potential to be a large part of the solution. Um, so we're kind of looking at how double crops could swing um, some of what we estimate is unprofitable cropland. And I'll walk you through what we think is unprofitable. Um, so how double crops might swing some of that land into the profitable category. So a quick assessment of barren land reported by the United States Department of Agriculture multiplied by county level switchgrass yields, those are modeled, um, shows that there's a potential for 116,000 acres um, to produce almost um, or over 850,000 tons of um, perennials or warm season grasses. An assessment of fallow or idle croplands. This is cropland that has um, stopped being cropped for several years. Shows that there's another large potential, especially in the western part of the state where we already see a lot of warm season grass production, but a huge potential, 60,000 acres that could go into warm season grass production and produce almost 450,000 tons of biomass. And then unprofitable cropland. So most farmers know which fields underperform. Satellite data could back that up. And we're working on a methodology for identifying places on the landscape that might be unprofitable. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard um, folks say they can make more farming switchgrass than farming corn. And we think this might be true, uh, especially on land that is underproducing for annual crops. So this, this methodology is still like in its infancy and we need to field verify results. Um, but I'll walk you through what we're working on and, and then we'll walk through some examples together. So first we obtain satellite imagery from two satellites that are constantly circling our globe. These are the Sentinel-2 and Landsat satellites. Sentinel-2, um, that was deployed in 2016. So we have a few years of data, 2016 to 2018. 2019 is being processed now. Um, and then Landsat has actually been um, circling the globe since the 70s. And we've been working with um, the 2010 to 2018 data sets. So we obtained the satellite imagery. And from those, we can calculate indexes of how much vegetation is on the landscape. Um, one remote sensing indicator is the NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index. We can also calculate um, how much water, excess water or deficit water is available at a given time period using another remote sensing indicator, the modified normalized difference water index. And from those we can calculate um, yield and then profit um, and estimate risk on the landscape. And so we'll walk through a few examples to break down this flowchart a little better. Um, and I guess one more thing before we do, the pixels that we get from the satellite imagery, um, the best resolution we can get is 10 meter right now. So 30 feet by 30 feet squares on the landscape. And you'll see those as we walk through the maps in the next examples. Okay, here it is in action. So this is an example in Lancaster County near the Southeast Ag Research and Extension Center along Chickies Creek, which is an impaired waterway. And this shows you the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, NDVI, which ranges from negative one to one. This was calculated by taking the near infrared satellite band subtracting from that the red satellite band and dividing it by their sum. So these satellites have different um, wavelength bands and you can take that data and use it in these equations. So we see 
um, roads and buildings pop up as like dark purple because there's no vegetation there. We start to see um, low vegetation cover, maybe it's fallow, maybe um, the crop didn't do so well, pop up as like red and yellow, and then um, greener areas, we see um, cornfields and hayfields and forests popping up. We can clip that image to what the United States Department of Agriculture reports as corn. So we're only focusing our analysis on annual crops in this case. And then we can calculate yield. So there are equations that relate the normalized different vegetation index to yields. And that's because um, people took these images and they measured yield at fields where these images were taken and they came up with a relationship between yields and NDVI. So yield is a function of this normalized difference vegetation index. So here we're mapping the yield in um, metric tons per hectare. And you can see red areas pop up as areas on, on these fields that might be really low yielding and green areas pop up as areas that are likely doing well. And then um, we can, when we follow all of those steps for all the years the satellite imagery is available for, we can do a quantitative risk calculation where we take the probability of those um, factors, in this case yield, occurring every year and multiply it by the yield and come up with um, a color-coded map of where there might be high-risk areas for annual crops and where there might be low-risk areas for annual crops. Here's a second example from a farm we are planting in collaboration with Clearwater Conservancy and, and this farmer starting this fall and into spring 2021. This is in Center County in the Half Moon Creek watershed. And so again, we take that um, remote sensing data, the near infrared and red bands, we subtract them and divide by their sum to calculate this normalized difference vegetation index. And we can see areas on the landscape where there are likely low and high vegetation. We clip it to the area to only include pixels that are identified as corn after we compute NDVI. And then we calculate yield as a function of that index. So again, we can kind of see hot spots popping up on the landscape. And you can see like the maps have these squares. Those are the pixels I mentioned. So the satellite imagery comes in these square pixels that are um, 10 meters by 10 meters or 30 feet by 30 feet. And then we can calculate risk. And this one's a little interesting because we'll be planting, um, I should have circled it here, but the, the um, field that's popping up as red to the left of where it says RW farm um, along the stream. So it's popping up as red, maybe low yielding, maybe um, will be a good story for this farmer. Ultimately, um, we do this for all the counties in the state, and this analysis was done at a coarser spatial resolution, so not as high as the 10 by 10 meter resolution I mentioned, but because of com computational power, this is what we've done so far. Um, and so ultimately, do we do this for all the counties in the state, and we come up with an estimated potential of um, acres that could be replaced with warm season grasses. And we found a potential 577,000 acres that could be replaced with full, almost 4.5 million tons of warm season grass mixtures. And you see a lot of these acres are concentrated in the southeast part of the state. And some of that is because that is where we see a lot of our corn production across the Commonwealth. So the takeaway is kind of the scale of this opportunity, maybe large when we move beyond buffers. You see existing switchgrass um, plotted in the bottom of this bar graph. Uh, tons are in green, acres of land are in blue. And again, you know, we have 2,000 tons of switchgrass or 2,000 acres of switchgrass producing about 18,000 tons from that. If we look at the goals of the phase three watershed implementation plan, we could convert some of um, those needed buffer acres into multifunctional buffers with warm season grasses. 
that's a little bit of an increase on this bar plot, plot stepping up to the buffer line. And then barren land and fallow and idle land represent um, larger opportunities potentially to expand warm season grasses um, on the field, on the landscape. And then unprofitable cropland represents a huge opportunity um, to produce more biomass um, for these warm season grass markets. And putting the numbers um, to perspective, when we look at those categories, multifunctional buffers with switchgrass mixtures, barren land, fallow idle cropland, and unprofitable land, there is a potential to convert six um, or 800,000 acres warm season grasses, produce over 6 million tons, and assuming $100 a ton just as an a market value, you know, almost 600 million in revenue potential. And so it's an, I think it's an exciting time for warm season grasses in Pennsylvania. Um, I, and maybe these systems can help us improve water quality and help the future, the farmers and the fish. Those are the three Fs I like to think about a lot. So thank you. And I'd love to answer and any questions you have and keep this discussion going. Steph, that was excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. How, how do you anticipate reduction of nitrogen? In one of the early slides, you talked about having to reduce by millions of tons by 2025. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of things that are going to be um, used and are already being used to reduce nitrogen. So how we fertilize our fields, better manure management, and making sure we're putting manure on at the right time, the right place, at the right rate. That's something that's definitely promoted across the state that we're practicing no-till farming. So we're reducing soil adding cover and double crops. I think there are a lot of, um, of best management practices that are being put in place now and continue to be put in place to help improve nitrogen. And I think buffers are just one piece of that equation. Okay. Um, but I think with, you know, when you add warm season grasses, especially on areas where you might have excess phosphorus or, you know, like a lot of nutrients that you need to take off, when you add in that harvest component, I think that becomes an, import, an important piece of the puzzle because then you're actually removing that nutrient from the system if it needs to be removed from the system. And then we can talk about like ways that we could potentially recycle that nutrient back into these agricultural systems, like digesting it and applying the effluent as fertilizer. So, so Steph, um, most of the land you talked about was um, well, how you classified as unprofitable. And it, it seems a bit surprising to imagine that farmers in Pennsylvania are farming half a million unprofitable acres. Can, can you help us understand why that might be and, and um, a little, say a little bit more about how you calculated an eight, whether an acre was unprofitable or not? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, so that analysis is certainly in its infancy. So when we calculate unprofitable areas, um, we are taking the revenue that you get from the predicted yield. So we calculate yield with the satellite data. We multiply it by the market price for that year, the average market price to come up with revenue that a producer is receiving. And then from that, we're subtracting the costs associated with that production. But right now, that analysis is only using um, like an average cost value taken from the enterprise budgets in the Penn State Agronomy Guide for no-till agriculture. Um, so those numbers do not necessarily reflect the pixels in the analysis because, you know, some fields need less fertilizer than others. Um, some fields are using different management practices than others. So 
what I really hope moving forward with this is that we start to um, like verify yields in the field and then work with farmers to um, come up with um, more accurate representations of what costs they have on, on their individual land pixels so we can calculate unprofitable acres. So yeah, what you saw in the um, county level slide was certainly a conservative view of unprofitable land acres across the state. And we also didn't include um, like double cropping in the map that I showed you. So we did an analysis looking at double cropping winter rye on acres that are unprofitable based on the analysis I showed you. And when you add in that as like an income to the farmer, then it does push some of those acres into profitable, into the profitable category. One of the things that's yeah. striking though is, I mean, I, I, um, I know a lot of farmers uh, in Pennsylvania don't have yield monitors on their harvesting equipment. Um, some of the bigger farms do, but a lot of folks are, you know, maybe if they're, har if they're, if they're weighing their yield, it's at a field level or a wagon level or an area that's much larger. So this, this idea that you can use satellite data to actually understand the yield and the profitability at a much smaller spatial resolution, very small areas, that, that seems really unique. Are there, um, are there many other many farms that are using that right now or are there private companies that can help uh, farmers understand that that aspect of their landscape? Yeah that's a great question too um, and you, you probably know a lot about this also. Uh, Ag Solver is one of them that came out of Iowa um, and they look at soil type and other indicators to estimate profitability on the landscape and um, I guess this is like a, a trend in agriculture right now where there are consulting companies popping up um, like Team Ag in the southeastern part of the state where they're, they're starting to work with um, farmers to use yield monitors and satellite imagery to kind of identify those areas. But I think this is, you know, uh, something that's still kind of up and coming and, um, you know, this data isn't readily accessible to farmers right now without maybe going through some of those consulting groups or others. So that's what I would like to see what happens with this project is that a tool is made and um, a farmer, anyone can just go in and um, do this analysis themselves and have that, that satellite imagery and, and the um, indicator data. Great, thank you. Jeff, how are you, you going to motivate farmers to, to establish uh, multifunctional buffers? Um, do, are you going to pay them per acre like CREP did or anything of that sort? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So right now there are funding opportunities where farmers can um, get the plantings paid for. So they'll get free seeds and, you know, trees along the stream in addition to the warm season grasses if they want that as their multifunctional crop. Um, but right now there aren't um, multifunctional buffer programs that will pay landowners annually for that acreage. Instead, they get the, the capital costs, the upfront costs paid for, um, which is still pretty exciting. And I think the big incentive is when we look at this spatial analysis of um, unprofitable areas, if you're not making that much money off of corn or something else on your landscape, then the motivation to switch might come from the fact that you could make more off of the warm season grasses, if that's the case for your area. Yeah, but the big incentive right now is certainly um, the fact that landowners can get grants through um, agencies like the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to pay for the planting cost, which is exciting. Because the association just finished a project on, on, on finding out where grass was planted throughout the, the Northeast, uh, I'm interested in your, your map demonstrating the, uh, the amount of switchgrass per county. How did, you, how did you gather that information? Yeah, I got that from, so the United States Department of Agriculture 
publishes what they call a cropland data layer every year. And you can um, visit that um, government website and actually download the county level um, areas for different crops. Yeah, and, um, and you can pull that into like Excel or mapping software or something. Does that, does that data come from the survey that they ask farmers to, to complete every year on what they've yeah. grown and what they're doing? Yep, exactly. Because there was nothing on that about switchgrass. I, was, I complained to them when I met them at Ag Progress Days last year saying, why aren't you asking for switchgrass information? Oh, interesting. I'll look into that then because maybe they're just, um, maybe they have another method of reporting that then. I assume. Yeah, they must. And I would be interested in yeah. what that was. Yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah, because they have a category um, specifically for switchgrass in that cropland data layer. And that, that data is available, I think, through... 2019 right now on the website, and I can share that. Um, I can put a link in this presentation for um, stakeholders when they view it to that data set, but I think it goes all the way back to like 1980. Wow, um, I would be very interested in seeing that. Yeah, and that's at a, it's a 30 meter resolution. So like the pixels in that image, it, they are 100 by 100 feet. I'm good. Any other questions? Not for me, but that was great. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Steph. Thank you. I hope everybody has a great rest of their weekend.